Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to the second of our four-part series on what, what is church really all about. We're trying to reboot our thinking about why we gather together. Since God has taught us many things in the last 12 months as we've come through the pandemic and now we're beginning to meet together physically more often, hallelujah, how can we process what we've learned and put it together with what the Bible teaches such that we can have a refreshed um, appreciation for why we gather and hopefully be useful to God and one another uh, by the power of the Spirit. Now, let's talk today in particular about Sundays. What are Sundays all about? What should we be thinking about as we come together on Sundays? How should we prepare our Sunday services? What should they include? Let's talk a little bit about that today. I'm just going to rattle through some scriptures and some ideas, and then you can have a good discussion about it in your local ecclesia, your local gathering, okay? Firstly, let's think about this. Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. Some of us think about it as the last day of the week, Monday being the first day of the week. But of course, if you're average, well, if you're Israelite and for that period of time when Jesus was around, Monday was not the first day of the week. Sunday was the first day of the week. Sunday was a working day. Sunday was also the day of creation, the first day, right? Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 5. God said, let there be light. There was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called a night. And there was evening and there was morning. And what is it called? The first day. The first day, creation, the first day. That's for us Sunday, if you like. Uh, also, uh, not only was the first day the day of creation, the first day was the day of recreation. In other words, the resurrection. Luke 24, verse 1. I'll put all these references in the show notes. Luke 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, that's a Sunday, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. That's the day Jesus rose from the dead. It's the day the two disciples encountered Jesus, though they didn't know who he was, on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 and verse 13. Now that same day, the first day of the week, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And what happens on that day? They encounter Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and they take the first communion on the first day of the week. We'll come back to that perhaps a little bit later. We see that the early church also met on the first day of the week. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, we came together to do what? To break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. That's a long uh, session together. First day of the week. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul assumes that the early church in Corinth met on the first day of the week because he says, on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2, on the first day of the week, each one of you, you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will need to be made. There's something going on there, first day of the week. And in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, we see uh, John writing this. He doesn't call it the first day of the week, he calls he calls it the Lord's Day. On the Lord's Day, I was in the Spirit. What could the Lord's Day be? It can only be the day of the resurrection, right? His day, the day that marked him out as different. It's the day of communion. It was a working day until at least the fourth century. Uh, the Emperor Constantine in 321 issued a proclamation to make Sunday, the first day of the week, a day off. In fact, I'll give you a quote here from his proclamation. He said, all judges, city people, and craftsmen shall rest on the venerable day of the sun, Sunday. But countrymen may, without hindrance, attend to agriculture. In other words, farmers, they can't sometimes take a day off. You can carry on working, but everybody else, you have a day off. That was started by Constantine and didn't happen in the days of the uh, early church. The eighth day is also in uh, Israelite thought, uh, symbolic of what happens after the Messiah comes. So when the Messiah comes, it's the eighth day. It's the day after everything else, after the Sabbath rest. We now have the Messiah day, the Messiah age. So there's something uh, significant going on there. The early church writers often wrote about the eighth day or uh, the, the, the day of gathering. Well, Justin Martyr, writing in about 160 AD, he says this, on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place. And the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. But Sunday, Sunday is the day on which we all hold a common assembly because it is the first day on which God made the world and Jesus Christ, our Saviour, rose from the dead on that same day. That's Justin Martyr. And finally, uh, with these early writings, Tertullian, 
writing at about 211 AD, he says this about the, uh, the eighth day, the Lord's day. We consider fasting or kneeling in worship on the Lord's day to be unlawful. You were told off if you knelt uh, to pray on the Lord's day. You were told off if you were fasting on a Sunday because it's the resurrection. It's the celebration day. So you're not allowed to do that. But the idea was this is the day of the resurrection. It's the day of new life. We've got to celebrate. There's no mourning. Uh, there's no kneeling. There's no fasting. It's it's time to celebrate. So that's what's going on on the eighth day. Uh, Paul Bradshaw writes this in his book called Early Christian Worship on page 78. He says, during the rest of the week, the church, the ecclesia, the called out, was dispersed and hidden in, around in, in society, right? They were dispersed and hidden as its individual members went about their life and work in different places. But on Sunday, the church came together and revealed itself in the celebration of the Eucharist, with each member occupying his or her place in the assembly. The church was, in a sense, invisible, became visible, at least in, in creating and helping to recreate an image of the fullness of Christ. Now, what did the um, early church services look like for the first Christians? We have a little bit of evidence in the Bible, which I'll go into in just a moment. But before that, what I'd like to do is point out the, the sort of melding of two things that happens in the New Testament. The first is this. We've got to bear in mind that the early church came out of Judaism. And so for them, their church services um, would have been synagogue uh, events. And we know Jesus went to preach in synagogues, and of course Paul did. And they had that tradition, that tradition that came, came out of the Babylonian Babylonian survival of the 6th century uh, before Christ. And what took place in most of those synagogue services was a reading of their history, of the history of Israel, uh, the scripture. There were songs rejoicing in that history of God being faithful to them. That's the Psalms, effectively. Uh, prayers blessing God for that history, that God had chosen them and been with them all through that time. So that's prayer. And then reflection on that history, which would have been a sermon. So you had four main elements of those synagogue services. Reading of scripture, uh, singing about scripture, if you like, praying about scripture or God and, and the history, and then a, a lesson. So those four elements would have been common to the early Christians. And then added to that would have become, uh, would have been added the communion. Many scholars think that for the big early days of the church in the book of Acts, they might have had a synagogue service in the morning with those elements I've just described, and then perhaps a communion meal together in the evening. So two separate events on the same day synagogue service or something similar to it followed by a communion meal in the evening where they would eat together they take bread they take wine they'd remember jesus they celebrate indeed and at some point in early church history it seems like those two elements got put together imagine for the early christians it must have been quite challenging to do that on a working day imagine if you had to do that for most of us on a monday you had to have a, a synagogue service probably in the morning before you went to work you'd have to gather together in someone's home before going to work, and especially for the slaves, that would be really early because they would have been the first, one of the first people up and working. So you gather first thing in the morning for something like a synagogue service, and then maybe you have communion after the, after work. So in the dark with a candle, no electric lights in those days, something like that. At some point in early church history, it looks like these two things got put together. So the elements of a synagogue service and the elements of a communion meal together got put together, and uh, that's what it seems um, began to happen. Um, fairly early on, as far as we can tell. So let me go into four elements of uh, Sunday gatherings that uh, we can think about for ourselves, what it means for us. So what does Paul tell Timothy? First of all, let's talk about teaching. First of all, teaching. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, this. He says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. The public reading of scripture, preaching and teaching, probably doesn't mean um, street preaching. He probably means just in the assembly, reading out scripture and preaching about it and teaching about it. It seems that there was something uh, very important there that Paul wanted Timothy to make sure he didn't neglect. Similar to the synagogue with a great emphasis on teaching. Of course, we know that Jesus taught in the synagogues and uh, he was also he was called the teacher amongst other titles. In Acts 20, which we've already referenced in verse 7, we find Paul speaking to the people and teaching there until after midnight. They've gathered on the first day of the week to break bread that evening, we talked about, and then he's also teaching there until gone midnight, or at least until midnight. A high value was placed in the early church on teaching and learning. We even see this in Acts 2, where they're devoted to the apostles' uh, teaching. So 
teaching is a vital element of our gatherings whenever we gather but it seems on a Sunday that's something that we see we see there we also note back in Luke 24 when those two disciples meet Jesus that the first post-resurrection communion also included scripture teaching because it says Jesus explained to them everything about Moses and the prophets uh, that they needed to understand about about him teaching communion going together on the first day of the week so a question for us to discuss might be what method of teaching works best for us when we gather in your circumstance in your group what method of teaching works best you need to have teaching I don't think there's any way around that but what method of teaching works best for you when you gather together how can you make the most of the teaching we receive from one another how can we make that the best it could be secondly fellowship fellowship was uh, was part of the fabric of the early church Acts chapter 2 we looked at that last week Hebrews 10 a passage familiar to many of us 24 and 25 let's consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together and the word there uh, episynagogue actually uh, implies some kind of official assembly so not just hanging out together but actually coming together to worship not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching or for example first timothy 1 22 which is more about i think the essence of it you now that you prove purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for one another love one another deeply from the heart i know that's not saying that's the first day of the week but that's the that's the the, the ethos that's the uh, the culture we're trying to develop here is meeting together regularly meeting together purposefully so that we can love each other more and more deeply what helps you make the most of your gathered fellowship what helps you to find that your meeting together your gathering together deepens your love in the way that peter talks about there as he uses that that word that phileo uh, root there earnestly ectenos a very deep earnest strong love third element to sunday gatherings breaking bread teaching fellowship breaking bread uh, acts 20 we looked at already twice they came together on the first day of the week to specifically break bread it, that's i think eating together as a meal but it's it's about communion surely because jesus said do this whenever you gather together in remembrance of me first corinthians 10 verse 16 is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of christ is not the bread which we that we break a participation in the body of christ so we see paul reminding the corinthians why they gather to eat and drink together it's about that communion about that lord's supper that jesus instituted in john 13 and verse 17 of first corinthians 10 because there is one loaf we who are many are one body we all share in that one loaf jesus in a sense being the loaf but us together being that loaf that body of christ so breaking the bread we're going to talk more about this in more detail next week but just for now what helps you to make the most of the breaking of bread when we are together what helps it to be most meaningful to you not just that you're on your own i mean the fact that we gather to do it together what makes that the most meaningful it can be for you thirdly what i'm going to call vocal worship and this is mostly about prayer and singing together in first corinthians 11 talking about their gatherings which presumably are the sunday gatherings in verse 4 and verse 5 paul says every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head it is the same as having her head shaved so what i won't get into the issue of head coverings but what i would say there is he's assuming that the church gathers to pray that men and women in the church gather to pray together when they are together on on a sunday or colossians chapter 3 verse 16 let the message of christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through what psalms and what are the psalms they're to be sung the hymns songs from the spirit singing to god with gratitude in your heart but singing to god collectively teaching and admonishing and uh, enriching one another colossians 3 16. so for your local gatherings the question might be in prayer and singing which of these are most meaningful to you and why why does it matter to do this together to pray together to sing together why does it matter and how can we make the most of it to enrich one another's faith and to uh, to, to honor god and to praise him and to tell the world something about him when people come and join us in our times of assembly what will make that the most meaningful right wrapping up sundays why sundays what's meant to happen on a sunday now i'm not giving a prescription here 
I'm not saying that um, there's only one way to have a Sunday service. Uh, I am laying out what I think are some significant principles about things that are vital to our, at least our typical uh, gathering on a Sunday. Uh, the scripture teaching and learning from one another, fellowship, uh, breaking of bread, communion, Lord's Supper, uh, and vocal worship, prayer, and, and music. They, they seem to be significant for lots of good scriptural reasons, which we've only touched the edge of here today. So if you've got some other uh, suggestions of scriptures that are relevant to this, do let me know. But we do know that Sundays are an essential part of how we edify one another, how we equip one another, and how we encourage one another. Worship, instruction, and fellowship bonded by communion remind us that we are one body and that we are centered on Jesus, celebrating him, rejoicing in him. He has brought us new life. We are in this new age. We have the life to come eternal. I mean, this is so exciting. Why don't you, the world, come with us on this journey? That's one of the reasons we gather. So final question for you. Next time you gather, maybe it's tomorrow, maybe it's this coming Sunday. The next time you gather with your local assembly, with your local gathering, why will you go? What's compelling you to go? What's motivating to you, you, to you to go? What will be in your mind and your heart as you step through that front door or, or step onto the, into the park or someone's garden? Why will you attend? What are you gonna, what, what's going to draw you there the next time you're able to be together? I would suggest you might want to write some things down. Write down, I am going to the gathering because, and clarify in your own heart and mind why it is that you are gathering. God has gathered, is gathering us together so that he can unify all things in the heavenlies and the earthlies. This is not a small thing. It's a big thing. It's, it's an inspiring thing. It's a visionary thing. It's a God thing. It's a Jesus thing. It's a Holy Spirit thing. And we are privileged to participate in that. Well, next week, we're going to go on and talk about the Lord's Supper. If you have any questions about that, do let me know. I'll do my best to answer them. I hope this has been helpful. We've rattled through lots of things. But nonetheless, nonetheless, I hope that these reflections will help us to reboot our thinking about why we gather. Till the next time, take care and God bless.